Many years ago, a man and his son went to town in a horse-drawn wagon. The man went into the general store and left his four-year-old son in the wagon. Something startled the horse, and it took off down the street with the little boy inside the wagon. Another man happened to be walking down the street, and he saw this going on. He, he quickly cut across and jumped upon the wagon and uh, brought the horses to a stop before uh, it could injure the little boy. So the little boy's life was saved by the actions of this man. Twenty-five years later, the boy is now a 29-year-old who's been in trouble with the law quite often. And he's brought into court for arraignment. He notices the judge was the same man that had saved his life 25 years earlier. He asked the judge if he recalled that incident. The judge did remember. And he expressed regret that the young man had not been more of a model citizen. He said, 25 years ago, I was your savior. Today, I'm your judge. That reminds us of Lord Jesus Christ. Today he's our Savior, if you will accept him. But if you do not accept him, one day he will be your judge. You will stand before him to be sentenced for all eternity. So we get the picture here. At this time, the, lost per the last person who will ever die has died. The last person who will ever be resurrected will be raised from the dead. Now comes the final fulfillment of that verse in Hebrews 9.27 where it says, As it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. After this, the judgment. It's judgment day for all those who died without Christ. This date has been set on God's calendar from the beginning of the foundation of the world. Now all the defendants are present. All the evidence has been submitted. The judge sits on his throne. Matter of fact, this is the final of three future judgments. Some people have, don't really understand that uh, there's not just one judgment day to determine whether or not you go to heaven or not. That's not in the Bible. There is a judgment seat of Christ for all believers. Not to determine whether you're saved or not. That is to determine your rewards in heaven. That takes place, I believe, right after the rapture of the saints. At the end of the tribulation, there is the judgment of nations. You read about that in Matthew chapter 25. Then there's a third judgment. What we're looking at today is the great white throne judgment when all the unsaved are brought before God to not to determine if they're saved or not. They're, they're all lost. But it's to determine their sentence because hell's not going to be the same for everybody. Some are going to get a stiffer sentence than others will get. So the great tribulation period has ended. The millennial reign of Christ has been completed. Satan has been cast into the lake of fire. Now we come to this event, the great white throne judgment of Christ. If you want to stand with me to read the text and honor God's word if you're physically able. We're in Revelation chapter 19. Or excuse me, chapter 20, isn't it? I'm in the wrong page here. Oh, right, here we go. Chapter 20, beginning with verse 11. John said, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according 
to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. You may be seated. Three things I want to point out from our text this morning, if you want to take notes. First of all, let's look at the fearful scene that is presented here. Verse 11 confronts us with a sobering truth of the ultimate encounter that we're going to have with this eternal judge. Two different judgments, but we're all going to stand before Christ one day. Either at the judgment seat of Christ or at this great white throne judgment. It calls our attention to two things. We read first of a sudden termination of the created earth and heavens as we know them today. They're going to burn up. Matter of fact, this was prophesied in the Old Testament. In Psalm 102, verses 25 and 26, it says, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou Lord shall endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. So the world as we know it today, one day is going to perish. Matter of fact, the first verse of chapter 21. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. So there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that God is going to create. So as we look at this, first of all, I want you to see the judge here and his unchallenged authority. The one sitting upon the great white throne. And a throne is often used in the Bible as a, as a symbol of authority. And here's the king of kings sitting upon this throne as the judge of the entire world. So why is it called the great white throne? Well, maybe two reasons. It's for those who have neglected a great salvation. As Hebrews says. And secondly, they're going to be judged by a great God. A great God. There is... No court of appeals here, folks. You cannot appeal to another court. What happens here is uncontested, unchallenged, undeniable. Now, in America, we're, we're kind of known for our judicial system, uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. But we, we have a lot of courts, don't we? We've got a divorce court, juvenile court, civil courts, criminal courts. Court of Appeals, there's State Supreme Court, there's United States Supreme Court, there's even a World Court. And each one has a distinctive docket of cases that they hear. Matter of fact, we need to be praying for our Supreme Court. We did a one call asking you to be praying about this abortion uh, issue from Mississippi, that our court will get it right this time. Amen. But here's a judgment at the great white throne of God. And this is altogether different. There's no jury. There's no prosecuting attorney. There's no defense counsel. God is the judge. The omnipotent God is going to preside over this alone. Not only an unchallenged authority... Well, it goes on to talk about the unquestioned identity of this judge. Who is this judge sitting on the throne? Well, there's no doubt about it. First of all, it's a white throne, which is a symbol of purity. The judge sitting on this throne cannot be bribed. Amen. His rulings are impeccable. Matter of fact, the very appearance of this judge causes the heavens and the earth to roll back as a scroll. 
The sun does not shine. The moon and the stars scatter from his very presence. Preacher, who is this judge? The Bible tells us in Romans 2.16. There it says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. According to my gospel. Jesus will be sitting on his throne. Jesus said in John 5, 22, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. So the Lord Jesus will be judged. He'll be judged, jury, and executioner. On this day, his face shall cause the elements of the universe to flee away. Hey, that face that was once spit upon, that face that was beaten and falsely accused. No doubt who this is. He'll be recognized by the scars in his hands and feet. You know, 2,000 years ago, God laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Jesus was falsely accused, put to death. But folks, there's coming a day when this same Jesus will be the judge. Pilate will stand before him. Caiaphas will stand before him. As will King Herod and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all unbelievers will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a fearful scene. What well, the Bible says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Second, I want you to see the faithful summons that is proclaimed here. We see in verses 12 through 14. A fearful scene is not only presented, but a faithful summons is being proclaimed. God calls back all those who lived and died without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of the process by which these lives are, these bodies are raised. John said he saw the small and the great. All those who had lived on this earth and died lost. Think about it as they come. Cain will be there. Ahab and Jezebel. Pharaoh and his hardened heart. Judas is carrying. All the way to the Antichrist and the false prophet. Each and every one will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. They are resurrected. The spirits are brought out of hell, reunited with the bodies that have been resurrected. Now, folks, listen. In the rapture and resurrection, those of us who've trusted Christ, we receive a glorified body. What kind of body are the lost going to receive? The same sinful, disease-wracked body that died. They're not getting a glorified body. They're getting an accursed body back. And that spirit from Hades will re-enter that old body. And there they will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. See, you need to understand. Those who die without Christ in their spirit, they go to hell. But hell's not the final place. Hell's kind of like county jail. But when they stand before Christ in this judgment, they're cast into a lake of fire. That's something different. Hell's like county jail. The lake of fire is like the federal pen. And they get a life sentence, an eternal life sentence in that place. Small and great. Think of who will stand before Christ. Think of the monsters of humanity like, like Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin and Bin Laden, Saddam Hussein. They'll all be there. All the serial killers, all the rapists, all the pornographers, all the dread, drug lords will be there. 
But not only that, those who lived a good law-abiding life who rejected Christ will be there. Our neighbors, co-workers who died without Christ will be there. The out-and-out -out sinner will be there. We know that. There are those today who hate God. Amen? They hate Christ. They hate the church. They brazenly shake their puny fist in the face of God. They'll be there. The self-righteous will be there. Those who think they're too good to be damned. They're nice folks. They go to church. But they've never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Folks, the worst sin anybody can commit is rejecting the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on their behalf. That's the worst sin. That's the only sin Jesus didn't die for. The sin of unbelief and rejection. The procrastinators will be there. I mean, those who intended to get saved one day. They heard the voice of God calling them, but they would harden their hearts. Can you feel your heartbeat? So I said, it's a muffled drum beating a funeral march to the grave. Starts beating in your mother's womb, doesn't it? Through childhood, young adult. Mine's been beating for 39 years. <laughs> no, wait a minute, I had a birthday. But one day, that's right. One day that heart starts. And you go into eternity. There's only two places you can go. Heaven or hell. Say, preacher, you're trying to frighten me? Hey, I'd rather frighten you into heaven than lull you into hell. That's what it takes. Tell you somebody else will be there on that day. Those who've never heard the gospel will be there. So, oh, preacher, that's not fair. They've never heard the gospel. Let me read something Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 in a parable he gave about the servants. He said in chapter 12, verse 47, Gospel of Luke, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But look at verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom much is given of him shall much be required. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God has revealed himself to all creation. He's revealed himself through creation. He's revealed himself through conscience. And those who will accept that, God will send them more. Faith unto faith. The Bible says all without excuse. All are without excuse. But it's our job to make sure they do hear the gospel. Matter of fact, let me remind you what we've already studied in Revelation. If you back up to chapter 14, during the tribulation period, everyone will hear the gospel. Do you know that? There's 144,000 will be preaching the gospel during tribulation. The two witnesses will be preaching the gospel. Then there's a, re, a, a proclaiming angel that will preach the gospel. In Revelation 14, look at verse 6. John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Look at this. To every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Jesus said, the gospel shall be proclaimed into all the world, and then the end comes. So during the tribulation, everyone will hear the gospel. And will have an opportunity to be saved. But not only the process we see here, I want you to note the principle. 
by which their lives are reviewed. It gives a, a careful detail to describe how the lost are going to be judged here. And most of all, it's going to be based upon God's Word. The books were open. So, preacher, what books? Are the, how about these 66 books of the Bible? They're going to be open. And they're going to be judged from the Word of God. Jesus said in John 12, 48, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Amen. Revelation says, They're judged every man according to their works. Jot this verse in your notes, Luke 8, 17. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid. Are you trying to hide anything? That shall not be known and come abroad. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You can't hide these things from God. All the secrets will be brought out. Now, salvation is according to grace. Amen? We're saved by the grace of God. Judgment is according to works. There's no grace involved in this judgment. It's all based upon the works. It says God is keeping records of our lives. Somebody asked Daniel Webster, who made the Webster's Dictionary, very intellectual statesman. Towards the twilight of his life, he was asked, what is the greatest thought that has ever passed through your mind? Quick as a flash, he said, my greatest thought is my accountability to God. Strange answer, isn't it? But it should be a, something that all of us think about. One day, we stand before God, and we will be accountable for what we've done with our lives here on earth. Everyone's going to be held accountable. What was covered up is going to be uncovered. What was done in secret is going to be exposed. God keeps excellent records, by the way. I think on that day, man's memory is going to come alive. Sins that were long forgotten are going to be brought back. They'll be judged according to their works. The book of life. You know, the Bible calls, it talks about the book of life and it talks about the Lamb's book of life. I think they're two different books. I think there's a book of life that records the names of every human that is born into this world. Then there's a Lamb's book of life that records all those who are born again, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Those who die without Christ, their name was never added to the Lamb's book of life. It's erased from the book of life. The names of the lost will be missing from the Lamb's book of life. There's a haunting song based upon that. Please search the book again. I thought my name was there. Well, some are going to say on this day. Search the book again. I thought my name was there. I thought I was saved. But they weren't. They were not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were trusting in something else, maybe trusting in their baptism or their church membership or, or whatever. But folks, salvation is based solely upon your trusting in Jesus Christ. And nothing else. Don't, don't add anything to it. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone that saves. Jesus told the disciples, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your name's written in heaven. You got something to rejoice over. Amen. 
And on this day, God's going to throw the book at some folks. The final thought I want to share with you is the forceful sentence that is pronounced here. The forceful sentence. I heard about a woman who was sentenced to die in the electric chair. Her last words in the court before she was executed, she said, somehow I knew all along God was running the show. But I thought I could steal one act to do my own thing. Doesn't work, does it? God is running the show. We can't steal an act to do our own will. Two things about this forceful sentence. First of all, it commences with an internal investigation. Again, we think about the search for the names of the unsaved. It's like God is double-checking to make sure their names are not there. Each person is judged by the Word of God. They're shown that their name is not in the Lamb's book of life. Then there's a book of all their recorded deeds that they have to give an account for. I thought about this. On this day, those who will stand before Christ. Jesus could say, what's your name? One would say, my name is King Herod. The great. I rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. One of the seven wonders of the world. I heard John the Baptist preach. My name's in the Bible. Jesus, I'm sorry. Your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. Then steps up another one and says, my name is Judas Iscariot. I was baptized by John. I was one of the 12 apostles. Hey, I was the church treasurer. Jesus will look at this one and say, it would have been better had you never been born at all. Depart from me. Let me show you something. Everybody knows John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now look at Romans 20, 15. You see another whosoever. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now think about this. There's two whosoever's here. Either you're in the whosoever of John 3, 16, or you're in the whosoever of Revelation 20, 15. I belong to whosoever believeth in him. John 3, 16. How about you? Which whosoever describes you? Will it be the whosoever that was not found written in the book of life? It commences with an internal investigation. It concludes with an eternal separation. Once the internal investigation is complete, the sentence is given, and there is an eternal separation from God. There's no graphic details here about hell or the lake of fire. We find that in other places in the Bible. But folks, here, the unsaved are cast out into outer darkness, never heard from again. They're never mentioned again. Their names are never called again. I got a feeling we won't remember them. Now, that's a little Westology. How are we going to deal with knowing our loved ones are in hell? I think we'll, God's just going to erase that from our memory. We're not going to remember them.
never heard from again. As we said that the saved receive different degrees of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, I believe that the unsaved receive different degrees of punishment at the great white throne judgment. I believe some will suffer in hell more than others will. Those who have committed great sins, can, can you imagine the sentence given to Adolf Hitler responsible for millions of deaths? How about these abortion doctors killing millions of unborn babies? I wouldn't want to be in their shoes on this day, would you? I wouldn't even know that I voted for these people on that day. We're going to have to be held accountable for some of that, folks. What about those who heard the gospel many times and yet refused it? Maybe they lived a good life. Maybe they're upstanding citizens. But they rejected a lot of light. They, they heard the gospel. It reminds you of what Jesus said to the people of Capernaum. He said, it's going to be worse for you on the day of judgment than for Sodom. Now we know what Sodom means. The degradation of those people. But the people in Capernaum... Jesus said, if the people of Sodom had heard and seen what you've heard and seen, they would have repented. So it's going to be worse for you, Capernaum, on the day of judgment. Because you were given great light and you rejected it. You've heard it said many times, if you're going to go to hell, you don't want to go to hell from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Talk about the Bible Belt. This is the buckle of the Bible Belt. Church house on every corner just about. You've got to reject a lot of light to die and go to hell from Tulsa. Amen. What would the condemned say in their defense? The son said, well, God, I, I didn't have time. For spiritual matters. No, you didn't make time. We all had the same amount of time. I didn't know which church to believe in. Salvation is not believing in the church, it's believing in Christ. Well, the hypocrites there at the church turned me off. Now you've got to spend eternity with them. I, a hypocrite is just a lost person pretending to be saved. They're all going to hell. I didn't like the pastor. I don't believe anybody will say that, but <laughs> salvation is not based on whether you like the pastor or not. It's whether you believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, it won't matter if your name is on some honorary degree or some hall of fame or some who's who of America if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life that's all that matters that's all that matters brother Russell we're going to have an invitation if you'll come ahead the musicians C.S. Lewis said everyone can be in one of two categories some are like Satan who said to God, not your will, but mine be done. Some say that to God, not your will, mine be done. Then others are like Jesus who said, not my will, but thine be done. Right? Now, if you die without Christ, on this day, I think a broken-hearted God will say, not my will, but thine be done. I'm going to have to cast you out because it's your will to deny the Lord Jesus Christ and refuse his salvation.
Folks, it's not God's will that any should perish. Do you hear me? It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Arnold Lewis worked as a supervisor in a shipyard. His job took him from ship to ship all day long. One day, an inspector was looking for Arnold about some matter. He had to search several ships before he found him. He was kind of frustrated when he finally found Arnold. He said, I've been looking all over hell for you. Use the language, but it's part of the story. Arnold said, well, that's one place you'll never find me. I'll never be in hell because I've been saved from hell by the blood of Jesus Christ. No more was said on that. They got their business settled and went their separate ways. But at the end of the day, the inspector sought out Arnold again. He said, sir, I've been thinking all day about what you said this morning. And I wish that I too could know that I am saved from hell. Arnold shared the gospel with him. They bowed their heads and he asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into his life to be his Lord and Savior. Hey, have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Here's the good news. If not, it can be today. Your name can be written in the Lamb's book of life today. Recording angel is ready to enter your name into that book. I'm not going to stand at this great white throne, Judge, and I'll tell you why. I settled out of court. Amen. I settled out of court. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. and He paid my sin debt so that I might be free. Have a home in heaven. How about you? Let's stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Once again, inviting you, if you need to be saved, if you need to come to Christ, confess Him as your Lord and Savior. We want you to do that. If you need to come for baptism or church membership, rededication, whatever the need may be, as we sing, if you need to come, come right now.